We'll just call it Found in the Bushes 18 years later or something. We don't have a name for it either. Um, and I have absolutely no idea on a drink for today. Oh. So we'll see how that goes. Be a good day for yeah. the stone fence, but we already did that one. I've got a lot of uh, Native American stories, if that helps spark some imagination. I feel like I shouldn't make Native American like <laughs> That feels wrong. <laughs> and I don't want it. Yeah. Um, Naming a new flavor of cocaine after Florida. I mean, that seems appropriate, honestly. <laughs> Hey everybody, it's a Booze and Spirits podcast. I was I was going to say that. Oh, were you? Okay, you yeah. can say it. Say it. No, never mind. It's like a drink with death. Fuck you. <laughs> I, was, I expected you to say it a few times now, but never did. This is Nick McDonald expecting his sister to start the show, and she did not, so he just started it anyway. This is Kate McDonald, drinking some room temperature vodka, not enjoying her life right now, but gotta do what you gotta do. Chasing it with Pepsi. Don't judge me. <laughs> You know it'll stop my alcoholism? Only pregnancy, apparently. <laughs> Just had a look on your face like you regret all your decisions, so there's no point in making decisions you don't regret now. That about sums it up, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you want me to do something stupid? I'll do it. <laughs> make you sick, make I just, you stupid. I, don't I just gotta stay alive, because I, I have a filthy farm baby that I, you know. I'm pretty fond of filthy farm baby filthy farm baby he's he has been, been downgraded or upgraded from forager like well he does that too still but uh so we had a tree cut down this week because it was falling apart and then we tilled that part of the lawn and put down new grass seed so there's like fresh chunky dirt and he's also discovered a bag of soil in the greenhouse so he's literally just been taking a handful of soil at a time tossing it places uh-huh and a lot of it ends up in his hair. Yeah. Yeah, it's a whole thing. Filthy farm baby right now. Well, we survived vacation. Or barely. TV. Barely. <laughs> I forget if I sent you the thing that says about three days of a family vacation, you start to understand Chris Benoit. Oh, wow. That joke, that that was too soon, bro. Too <laughs> soon. Was it? I made a 9-11 joke yesterday. Kel was not pleased with me. <laughs> that. Yeah, probably just poor timing. Um, I'm now obsessed with Columbia, California. Yeah, I was telling somebody about that because I said, oh, I was telling them about Yosemite. They're oh, I really want to go to Yosemite. I said, well, if you do, go to Columbia because that shit's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Sean and I decided Murphy's would be a good place to go back sans children. Because mm -hmm. there's so many wineries and tasting rooms on that like one little main street mm. that if you had a sample at each one, a sample. I'm not talking a glass. I'm talking you did a taste. <laughs> You'd be litty lit. So, you know, that's on our to-do list for later in life. So, I want to ask, on a energy-sensitive paranormal level, what did you think of Yosemite? Well, I was incredibly car sick the whole time. Oh. So, uh, I felt nauseous. Mm hmm And, I don't know, the energy to me felt somehow really stale even though there was so yeah, many people that's what i thought that's what i was gonna say like because like normally like if i go to like you know even if i'm just walking down the street like you can touch a tree and you can feel some energy off that i like sat and put my hand on a tree and there was just nothing like it like the whole area wanted nothing to do with people yeah and i i'm willing to like let part of that be because the smoke was pretty heavy the day we were there, so I thought maybe that was part of it. Well, we were above the smoke when I had that realization. Yeah, but no, this the energy felt pretty stagnant there, even though there was a lot going on. Well, and, like, the rocks had a lot of, like, energy, but it was kind of counter energy. Like, like I'm not entirely convinced that's not what made me sick. I mean, yeah, no, I could definitely see, like, that forest not wanting to be the tourist trap it is. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> Which is very bizarre. Like, Yellowstone was very inviting. I don't, you know, and that's the one where, you know, there's a geothermal event willing to kill you every 30 feet, so. Yeah, no, um, 
I was okay with our Yosemite trip involving very little Yosemite. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't. Well, and I didn't know it till we got there, too, but, like, so much of Yosemite is really a hiker's park. It's really not. Yeah, no. Like, like with Yellowstone, like, most of the big things you can drive up to and, like, you know, walk a quarter mile at most to get to. But, like, everything was at the end of a three to four mile trail there, which was not conducive to little kids. Yeah. Or people who are out of shape with quarantine bodies. <laughs> my, uh, my little kid did enjoy playing in some they had nice dirt there. They did have nice dirt at Yosemite he enjoyed playing in. And then we stopped in that little town. There was a little town at the base of the, like, the hill coming back into Sonora. You know, like. Yeah. One of the little 200 people towns. Yeah, and that gave, we stopped there because Killian was going crazy and let him run around at this playground we saw, and that little town gave me some very, like, concrete vibes. Yeah, I know exactly which one you're talking about. I like, it didn't, thing. it didn't look like concrete, but it felt like I wasn't really wanted there. Yeah. Like, we shouldn't <laughs> be here, so. And, back to the missing 401, and back to Yosemite. There was a news story right after we got back of some family, uh, two parents and a baby and their dog. And their dog. And their dog that went out hiking and were found all dead with no apparent cause of death. So that just, there's another missing 411 for the area for me. Right. And they, I think after they did the autopsy, they still aren't sure. They sent people out in hazmat crews to look for like a noxious gas leak. Yeah, they're looking for noxious gas. They had a theory about toxic algae at one point. But, the last theory I saw is like, oh, it must be toxic algae. But they got nothing off the autopsy. I saw that they were hoping that the autopsy on the dog would give them something, but I don't know if that's been uh, yeah, published yet or not. Updates. But uh, yeah, usually people don't die with their dog in forests. Usually the dog somehow stays alive. Yeah. Usually, you know, a group of four things don't just drop dead for no reason at all. <laughs> yeah, and they were saying that they were familiar with the area, like they had rental properties nearby because they loved the area so much, even yeah. though they lived in the Bay Area or something. But yeah, no, uh, no real reason for that to be happening. They could, uh, <laughs> could surmise. So, so Yosemite missing four hundred one just keeps uh, being weird and uninviting. The whole area should be cornered off. <laughs> Apparently. Well, you want to talk about some news stories? Sure. I'll talk about some news stories inspired by our uh, vacation. Mining mining stories? Because we didn't really know what we were going to talk about. We we never did record anything because, well, the whole trip is a fucking hassle. Uh, but we did decide, well, let's, let's, what do we want to talk about now? And uh, we, there's lots of mining things around in Yosemite. So we thought, well, let's find some mining stories. What? Wouldn't that be fun? Well, and I went out of my way to not do a, like, Yosemite mining story. I was, like, reading about all the haunted hotels in the Sonora area and Yosemite area, and those were fun. But I, I made myself veer off that path. Yeah, you're better than me. <laughs> I stayed right there. Fair enough. One thing that we did is we went to visit the Moaning Caverns. And I didn't get to go into the Moaning Caverns because Rowan, our youngest, kind of had a panic attack about the claustrophobia because it's... You have to kind of squeeze down a few staircases to get to this landing area, and she freaked out at that point. And then even after you get to the the landing, you have to go down like a 140-foot spiral staircase to get to the bottom. <laughs> that was made out of like a World War One boat or something, wasn't it? Yeah, I believe so. But uh, <laughs> so that was pretty intense. And she, I mean, like I said, she gave up before she even got to that point. So someone needed to stay with her, so I stayed behind. So I kind of missed the uh, caverns themselves. But they do get their name from a moaning sound that occasionally emanates from the cave. The Miwok people, a local tribe. You didn't say Ewok. Okay. No, I said Miwok. <laughs> Better. You were an indoor? You didn't even tell me? <laughs> they had a legend about the cave being home to a stone giant named Yayali, who lived in the cave and, and would lure people to their deaths with the noise. The cause of the noise, they believe now, is an erosion feature inside the cave where long holes eroded into the cavern floor, and when the wind blows across the floor, it's like a bunch of little bottles, mm. and inside the large void area there, it gets amplified out. So they first thoroughly explored the Moaning Caverns during the Gold Rush. Here's where the miners come in, in the 1840s. 
Inside, they did not find any gold, but they did find a mound of human skeletons that had been accumulated over the past 12,000 years. Huh. Like, literally a mound? Not just in a, like, scattering? The things I was reading both said mound and both and said scattered. So okay. they the, the cave showed no sign that anyone had voluntarily explored it up to that point. Like they didn't find any torches or old ladders or anything. The speculation is that skeletons ended up there by either falling into the holes that were obscured by plants, or um, like I said, it's got kind of a squeeze through area at the beginning and then opens up to a larger hole. They think that maybe some people tried to explore it thinking it'd be real easy, and then they got to a point where they just couldn't get back out. Most of the bones are scattered. They've been dispersed around. Very few complete skeletons have ever been recovered, but the ones that were recovered indicate that the skeletons in there are not ancestors of the Miwok, Mm -hmm. which, and the Miwok have lived there since white men arrived in the area, so. Yeah, they've been there a while. (laughs) So I'm not sure how far back that goes. They did find a old mother of pearl bracelet inside the cave that dated to about 8,000 years old. And also interesting, that shows it's indicative of uh, trade between the local people there and, you know, coastal people and others over a large area. Interesting. So I looked into uh, Yayali. I could only find one story about Yayali, so I was going to go ahead and tell that story. Okay. And it's weird because the story came up when I searched Yayali, but they never called him Yayali within the story itself. They just call him the giant. The giant was heard approaching through the hills by Chipmunk and his wife, so Chipmunk went to greet the traveler, thinking it might be his brothers. Instead, he found the giant and saw the large basket on his back and decided to return home. Where are you going? asked the giant. To my assembly house, replied Chipmunk. Go ahead, said the giant. I will go with you. Upon reaching Chipmunk's house, Chipmunk tried to invite the giant to go in, but the giant replied, You are the owner of the house. You lead into your own house. I am not the owner. To avoid an argument, Chipmunk turned and entered, and as he did, the giant pulled a stone from his basket and threw it at Chipmunk's back, killing him. The giant entered the house and ordered Chipmunk's wife to help him bring in the meat. He made himself at home and married Chipmunk's wife. He cooked Chipmunk and ate him and insisted to Chipmunk's wife, You eat it. You eat it. The giant then left the home, blocking all the entrances with boulders so Chipmunk's wife could not escape. She dug a hole, hiding her daughter from Chipmunk in the hole and feeding her deer meat. She was afraid the giant would kill her daughter, and left her in there to keep her hidden. At sundown, the giant returned. In his basket, he had many people whom he had killed. He cooked them up and ate them, and insisted that Chipmunk's wife eat too. Chipmunk's wife pretended to eat along with the giant, but instead she secretly ate deer meat. I think I am a very good husband indeed, said the giant. We have plenty of meat, more meat than your old husband brought. We will not starve. Then he danced and danced and stuck his large head through the house's smoke hole as he danced. He was unaware that Chipmunk had brought his wife plenty of deer meat, which she was able to use to feed herself and her daughter. For some time this went on. The giant would leave the hunt, trapping Chipmunk's wife in the house. She would feed her daughter deer meat and keep her hidden. The giant would return with the people he killed, cook them up, and insist that she ate. She would always secretly eat deer meat instead. Then he would dance and stick his head through the smoke hole. Eventually, Chipmunk's wife bore the giant two sons, so she would have to wait until they slept and the giant left to hunt before she could feed her daughter. That sounds painful. Chipmunk having a giant baby? Chipmunk's brothers below the hill would dream of him. One said, I will go and visit my brother. I had a dream that he was sick. When the brother arrived at the house, he asked his sister-in-law, Why are these boulders against the doors? The giant does it, she told him. He murdered your brother and closes the doors with those large boulders when he leaves. What of Chipmunk's daughter, the brother asked. When will the giant return? I have her hidden in a hole in the floor. I never let the giant see her. He often hunts long into the night. I do not expect him home until morning. Then he will cook the people he killed and dance and dance and stick his head through the roof's smoke hole. Chipmunk's brother told her that now is her chance to escape. The giant has many brothers and they may pursue you. Crush up obsidian into dust and if they get close, blow it into their eyes. Chipmunk's wife fled the house and his brother got to work. First he dug tunnels throughout the house in all directions with openings both inside and out. Then he got a manzanita stick and sharpened one side of it. He worked on it all night, and by morning it was very sharp. Chipmunk's brother waited outside the house until he saw the giant approaching. When the giant approached and saw Chipmunk's brother, the brother ran into the house. The giant was excited to have another victim and ran into the house. Inside, the giant found that the younger giants were dead, and their eyes had been gouged out and thrown into the fire. They were also stabbed in the ankles, where Chipmunk's wife revealed that Chipmunk's brother, Giant's hearts, were located. And that's how that was presented in the story, too. It's just, oh yeah, by the way. 
The giants tried to catch Chipmunk's brother, but the brother was too quick and kept popping into one of his holes and popping out somewhere else. The giant was getting frustrated, and Chipmunk's brother called to him, You cannot catch me unless you dance. After you dance, I'll let you catch me. I want to see you dance first. The giant laughed because he loved to dance and quickly began dancing. Speaking of giants. As the giant danced, Chipmunk's brother popped into a hole and came back out again. He quickly climbed to the roof of the house, and when the giant stuck his head through the smoke hole, Chipmunk's brother decapitated the giant with the manzanita stick, and the head rolled off the roof down the hill and landed near a stream. Chipmunk's brother then cut up the body and spread the meat in the trees and on the rocks and inside and out of the house. And that's about half the story, because it goes on from there, like, the giant's brothers have a dream about the giant, so they come to check out, and they find all the meat, and they think, oh, look at all the meat that our brother got, and they start eating it until they realize it is the giant, and then they pursue the wife, and she throws the obsidian dust in their face and gets away, and it's, it, it, like I say, it just goes on and on and on and on. On and on and on. But it was, I found this interesting, because I wasn't aware of, of too many native stories about giants. Like, I hear people bring up the Nephilim, and I thought that was just something that Judeo-Christian was tr- kind of dropping on top of Native Americans. But um, I guess there actually is quite a few giant stories I was able to track down. So so the main stone giant myths I found came from the Northeast. Is that where the Iroquois are from? It's Iroquois. <laughs> they uh, talk about the stone coats, which are a 10-foot giant associated with winter and ice. They are man-eaters, and they're covered with stone scales that make them immune to normal weapons. Some say that they were cursed for eating human flesh, and the stone coat tail is similar to a lot of other tribes, like the Cherokees had the stone clads, the Abenakis had the Gawakwa, the Misox had the Jinu, the Crees have the Wittico, and of course, everybody knows about the Wendigos, and all of those stories, they all share some variation of cannibalism and a curse and ice transformation, so that story is spread out pretty wide. In Tennessee, the Choctaw ran afoul of white giants called the Nahulo, and this is when the Choctaw first crossed the Mississippi. Uh, the Nahulo were supposed to be cannibals, and the Choctaw killed them whenever the opportunity arose. Interestingly, the word Nahulo eventually went on to describe all white men in the Choctaw language. Are these the feral cannibals of which TikTok speak? I don't know. Just I hadn't considered that. Probably um, not, but probably I'll not. throw that out there. In 1857, a Comanche chief Rolling Thunder gave an account of a tribe of 10-foot-tall white men, far more rich and powerful than any white man living at the time. And they occupied a territory that stretched from sunrise to sunset, he said. So I don't know if that means the whole country or how long you can travel in a day. Anyway, they supposedly had fortifications on all the mountains that protected their vast cities located in the valleys. Quote, they excelled every other nation which was flourished, either before or since, in all manner of cunning handicraft, were brave and warlike, ruling over the land they had wrestled from ancient possessors with a high and haughty hand. Compared with them, the pale faces of the present day were pygmies in both art and arms, end quote. This race of white giants became too proud and forgot justice and mercy, so the great spirit wiped them out, leaving only mounds still visible on some tablelands. The Navajo tell of the Starnaki, which was a regal race of white giants that had advanced mining technology dominating the West, and enslaved lesser races with strongholds throughout the America. So that's real close to Rolling Thunder's story there. According to Tale, they were either extinguished, or they, quote, went back to the heavens. Hmm. This one's from South America, the Manta people of Peru. They tell of large white men who arrived in giant reed boats, and stood so tall that an ordinary man would only come up to their knee. But reportedly, they had revolting sexual habits, and heaven wiped them out because of it. Ah. <laughs> they were stone sodomites. Got it. Last, I believe this is pronounced Sitikas. It might be Sitikas. I think it's Sitikas. The Paiutes had an oral tradition of the Sitikas, ten-foot-tall white cannibals with red hair who lived near Lovelock Cave. Uh, that was before the Paiutes were wiped out by explorer Joseph Walker in 1833. Explorers to Lovelock Cave have reported finding evidence of human bones cracked open to get at the marrow within the cave, as well as the bodies of humans with red hair, though it is possible uh, under the right conditions for black hair to turn red over time. 
Okay. The bodies were found mummified under four feet of bat guano, but they did reach a height of up to six foot six, which is exceptionally tall for a native tribe. Yeah. Not to say that they never got that tall, it just was very un- uncommon. So that's what I found about, it was It was a little bit of a side tangent from mining. I mean, yeah. it, it started as with a do. mine, it started with a mine and it spilled into stone giants of native lore. One of us went on a tangent? <sighs> No, I know, right? So it's practically weird. required at this point. So weird. <laughs> um, well, I don't know if you remember this story. When I was little and I was at Grammy and Grampy's house a lot to get babysat, mm-hmm. Grandma used to go do her, like, Mormon stop at everybody's house stuff. Mm-hmm. They had these friends, this couple. They were the sweetest people. I don't remember their names, but the husband had been, I think, a geologist, but maybe he was just a miner or something along those lines. But he would like would show me all of the stuff he found. Uh-huh. But he didn't have all of the stuff anymore. And, like he had all these cool rocks and things. And he was telling us one time that he found what was like could only be described as like a what you would picture a Viking helmet being, uh-huh. but it was designed for a giant. <laughs> <laughs> and it was confiscated when he found it. Oh. So Well, and, and something about the Sitekas, or Sitekas, they, uh, there are a lot of people who have some speculation that the government showed up and covered up any instance of giants hidden there. And I have heard, I have seen lots of, you know, the paranormal sheets talk of native giants that have been found and then covered up or moved or hidden, things like that. Interesting. Well, I mean, they did find... I think it was Anthropithecus gigantus. Mm-hmm. It's like a giant species of human. They're starting to find some fossil evidence of well, humanoid, not an anthropod. It's not a, yeah, not a modern human. But you know, those are supposed to be, I think, like seven plus feet tall. Mm-hmm. It's been a while since I took an anthropology class, but well, an interesting thing to me about the those, Peruvian, and I think those were in Asia. Okay, go ahead. And interesting to me about the Peruvian one is that also dovetails with some of the tales that Graham Hancock has put forth in uh, Fingerprints of the Gods and his research into a forgotten civilization that spanned the globe. Like, a lot of South American tribes have stories of white men arriving on reed rafts that had advanced technology. Well. Did you stay more on task than I did? Ish. I didn't go too far off task. I mean, we've been more off task before. For real. Um, so you mentioned the Paiute, which transitions nicely into my story. <laughs> so I um, found out about the hell dogs or hell hounds. They're called both. Usually it looks like they're the hell dogs. The hell dogs of El Dorado Canyon. Ooh. El Dorado Canyon is in Nevada. Mm-hmm. Um, it was originally the home of Paiutes and the Mojave tribes. It gained a reputation for being full of gold, so the Spanish conquistadors came, like, piling over to get it. Um, Is that one of those locations that got the reputation but never had any, or did they actually, or do um, you know? Because I feel like a lot of those stories, like, the hey, we're going to go there and pillage all the gold, and, like, they always I ended up with not much. believe... Like, I know they raided the Aztecs for a ton of gold, but I feel like a lot of those legends just went nowhere. So I think that there was some gold. It's not the gold they thought that would be there, but there mm-hmm. was, it's called the Salvage Vein, which was mm. the Muller lobe there. But by the, you know, mid-1800s, gold prospectors were showing up there, and it insinuated in these stories, I found that the miners that were showing up there were kind of the, even sketchier than you know the regular miners. How do you get sketchy for a miner? I don't know, but that's what's <laughs> insinuated in these stories. So a lot of them were on the run from the cops or civil war deserters. You know, sketchy for a miner, like sketchy for a like, miner. Instead of fighting dogs, they're having like a Jew fight. I don't even understand. Yeah, I, I don't know. Anyway. There was a lot of murders, a lot of gunfights going on in this canyon. And then there was also, since this was happening around the time of the Civil War, the Northerners and the Southerners that both ended up in this area were, like, fighting. And the Native American tribes were still running raids. You know, it just, it was a thing. There was no lawmen coming. It was a Donnybrook. It was a real slobber knocker. <laughs> the, the Texas Rangers were not going to go up there, you know. The inf- mm. Everybody's busy. <laughs> they don't want to deal with that shit. It's like, 
let them kill each other and we'll, we'll deal with it later. <laughs> we'll deal with the survivor after they figure it yeah. out. Yeah. It did say occasionally federal troops would come through, but not very often. And then finally they put a military outpost there, essentially to protect the steamboat traffic that was going along the Colorado River mm. and not to keep the miners from fighting each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's no reason to stop the miners. I mean, that gold all made it into the general economy eventually, yep. so it didn't matter who brought it. <laughs> so the... To Chattacup Mine is one of the more prominent mines there, and it, it produced more than two and a half million dollars worth of gold, silver, and copper and lead. And it closed in 1945. There's supposed to be like human ghost stories of this canyon, but mm-hmm. there's also these hell dogs. Some people think they're demonic. Some people just think they're the ghosts of these dogs. But a lot of the miners would bring dogs, basically tie them up at the front of their mines make them vicious and use them to defend their land. And when the mines dried up or they moved on or they died, they just left the dog or they killed the dogs and left. Hmm. Or people trying to break into the claims would kill the dogs also. Like I was going to say, these poor it's, dogs it's just, not much of a defense. It's just, oh, let's shoot those dogs that are tied to the entrance. Yeah, pretty much. So not a good place to have dogs. Plus it's the desert. These dogs are not having good no. lives for babies. <laughs> But it's thought that a lot of those dogs are still there guarding the canyon. There's so, dogs. like, we've got, like, a an angry collective of dog spirits all yes. masked up, and I like that idea. Yeah. So I've got a couple of stories here that I'll just read because they're not super long. So this one is from the Shadowlands website. The witness who has gone to the area, he went with his brother to, compl- to complain. <laughs> To uh, investigate the claim. Hey, mom says it's my turn in the gold mine. (laughs) For many years, people have come out of this canyon with tales of sightings and in very few instances, terrifying accounts of actually being attacked or chased by these alleged ghost dogs while exploring various different mining or town sites in the area. Curious as to the validity of such tales, my brother and I made the decision to do a little exploring on our own. On the first few excursions, we found nothing as was expected. However, on the last adventure, we stumbled onto what we thought was just another anonymous shaft site. We looked closer at the site. We noticed about an eight-foot, severely weathered chain embedded into the rock wall at the entrance to the shaft. Well, curiosity got the best of both of us, and foolishly, we entered the shaft. There we came upon the bones of what appeared to be a large dog. We decided to camp here as the day was coming slowly to an end, decision that we later would come to regret. The still desert night closed in as we had dinner and relaxed around our small campfire. We heard what we assumed were coyotes yipping and calling off in the distance. The atmosphere became thick and very uneasy. We now felt that we were being watched from a very close distance. What we thought was the nighttime breeze now sounded more like panting or breathing of large dogs in close proximity. Then we heard growling, grating, low, and hateful. The fall of paws on the desert sand now became apparent. They seemed to circle the campsite. We were surrounded. That's when the scratching started. It came from the area where the chain was. That damn chain moved. It seemed to tug away from the rock wall, pulling harder and harder each time. We fumbled for our gear and stumbled to our feet. My brother shone the flashlight at the chain. There were scratch marks on the rock. There were what appeared to be blood stains on the wall, seemingly where the unfortunate dog furiously clawed at the chain base in the rock itself. The chain dropped. Something brushed against my leg, and I struggled to keep my balance. My brother caught me, and we ran like hell toward the car. The fall of the canine footsteps and wild panting chased us all the way. Never run faster in my life. On the road heading out of the canyon, we were paced for a good two or three miles, at least by what seemed to be a pack of wild strays. We made it home, and I will never forget the terror of being chased by this pack of spectral hounds. Fun. Yeah. Um, I have another one from the King Sasquatch Paranormal and Cryptozoology blog. King Sasquatch, eh? King Sasquatch tell by his bulbous blue ass. Yeah. That's a Sasquatch baboon? What? Mandrill. Yeah, I think so. Has any of your team members ever heard about the hell dogs of El Dorado Canyon? I think I just seen one. I was with my buddies for a fun weekend at blank. Redacted. Redacted. Sitting up camp and seeing a ghost dog in our camp. We spent the day on our dirt bikes and off-road trucks four-wheeling it till about six. While cooking dinner, my buddy Paul said he'd seen a coyote crouching in a defensive stance. My other friends, Helen and Mike, said they hadn't seen a thing and they were next to him. After the hot dogs were done and everybody was fed and watered, we started a campfire to settle down before we went to bed for the day. 
I'd say it was a quarter after nine when we had all seen a big shadow of a dog on the tent wall. Helen screamed, and when she did, the shadow disappeared. I came home today and looked up this animal, and it says it's called a hell dog of El Dorado Canyon. Somebody there needs to be selling like hot dogs called hell dogs, or they're missing on a, on a huge opportunity. In this very untraveled portion of Nevada. Fuck yeah. Someone's got to live nearby, and they can sell hot dogs. Get on it, Nevada. There's also, uh, this was also from the King Bigfoot website. This is from about the same place on the Colorado River. And this suggestion, it may be more than a ghost. This is posted for my son, about 12 years. Is this going to end up like the red ghost, like the ghost camel, like where it's actually just a pack of dogs? I hope so. (laughs) About 12 years ago, my son and his wife were visiting Redacted for their third honeymoon. (laughs) They rented an older boat and drifted along redacted around two in the morning my house i'm just gonna i'm gonna replace all of your redacteds with you saying retarded just to bring this full circle flowers (laughs) around two in the morning my house phone rang off the hook with my son frantically shouting that he had just seen a mutant dog with a piercing howl attempting to catch a duck he forwarded the details of a four-foot mangy dog with a terrifying with terrifying overlapping teeth he said the dog failed to catch ducks and ran off hungry when they shined the flashlight onto the shore so are these phantom ghost dogs? Yeah, it doesn't are sound these... like a ghost dog. That sounds like a hunter degree dog, unless that duck was out trying to steal some gold. I mean, that's a real big dog. Like Scrooge McDuck? Was it Scrooge McDuck? Was that the duck? Oh. Trying to steal the gold? Scrooge McDuck wasn't trying to steal gold. He was trying to keep his gold. No, a lot of times he's out treasure hunting to find gold. Well, I don't feel like he was trying to steal gold. They would solve a mystery or rewrite history. DuckTales, woo I am. Fine. Um, so yeah. Are they dogs? Who knows? And, you know, there's a lot of these little stories where people think they encountered them, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of, like, concrete evidence. So, Hmm. um... A lot of anecdotal... Sean's always trying to convince me we need to move to Vegas, which is a terrible decision. But if we do, maybe I'll go (laughs) hunting for for hellhounds. As one does. Not Irish hellhounds. When you live in Vegas. Not Irish hellhounds. (laughs) Sorry, I'm getting messages about my baby. Oh. Oh. See on fire. He's speaking in tent today because he refuses to nap where he's supposed to nap. So he'll go nap, but not where he's supposed to. That way he gets to maintain control of the situation. Yeah. <laughs> yep. He's a McDonald. <laughs> All right. So do you have, I know you said that you didn't have, you came into this really vague on drink idea. We've got stone giants. We've got white giants. We've got. Hot dogs and hell hounds. Is any of that sparked any? Yeah, I'm going to make a hot dog and gold schlager. going to be like hot dog water and gold schlager. Shake it. I mean, we do have your uh, bratwurst Bloody Mary sitting around somewhere on a back burner. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's not what I, I'm going to go with. A, I, I do have a drink. Came up with one. All right. So. I had faith. Well, you know, got to do what you got to do. So I think I'm going to do, because Stone Giant. I think I'm going to do a stone fruit beverage. They might be stone giants. They might be stone giants. So I think I'm going to just do like some fresh plums because I have an abundance of those at the moment. And <laughs> I think I'm going to make maybe some like thyme syrup. And I'm going to top that off with like some dry bubbles. It's like dry rosé bubbles. That's what I'm thinking. Okay. Are you going to leave the stones in the drink? I hadn't planned on it. Yeah, I'd probably make it a little bitter pretty sure yeah i'm pretty sure my child ate like five plum pits yesterday in his foraging that's gonna be a problem yeah <laughs> um and i really hope these plums are what i think they are because they're not in our yard they're coming over the neighbor's fence i think they're mirabelle plums but i'm not entirely sure so neither one of us has died yet okay. i ate some too just to make sure we didn't die are there poisonous plums? I don't know. I've never, well, of, I didn't, I've never heard of a poisonous plum. I, I wasn't confident they were a plum at first. I'm like, and Sean was like, what are these? And I put one in my mouth and went, I really think it's some sort of plum. We went up to see the sequoias at Big Tree Park, and the ranger told us that the berries, the red berries that were around are poisonous, and they knew that because the bears refused to eat them. Makes sense. Well, you should never eat a red berry unless you're confident. No, it of is. course not. But a yellow plum, I mean, I feel like that's relatively safe. Well, fruit trees, in the most part, are made to be eaten. Like, that's how they spread. Yeah. They're like cherry-sized yellow plums, so I think they're Mirabelle's. 
But uh, hmm. yeah, so I'm going to do a plum time bubbles, bubbly bit. Plum and time, plum and time. And I'm fine with calling it They Might Be Stone Giants. Oh, all right. Guess it'll have to be a real big glass. <laughs> a punch bowl with a handle. I mean, I'm not above drinking pitchers, so. <laughs> it's happened before, it'll happen again. All right. Um, What should we do next episode? Well, I found a story I want to do, but I don't know what we want the plot there to be. Well, I don't know. Throw out a couple themes, like... Or just pick one. I'll find something. I don't give a shit. I'll find anything. Let's do make sick, make stupid. That's right. Boats. Boats. I can do boats. Okay. Boats are easy. Boats and hose. I can think of three boat ghosts right now. Boats and hose. I mean, I'm sure there's other good boat ghosts. So we will do boat stories. I'm on a boat. Next episode. Is that what we're doing? We're doing a boat. We're doing boats. Boats and hose. So I guess we should wrap this up unless we've got something else to ramble about. Yeah, I got homework to do. Right. Well, I don't know why I make these decisions. I don't myself. know. I know things get very complicated over the next few months because school starts and I'm going back to work. I'm only going back to work part time this year and spooky month is coming and Christmas is coming. Theater season starts back up. So I think we'll be able to manage keeping shows coming every two weeks. Yeah, we'll find out. We'll find out. <laughs> Only four of you will care anyway, so. Yeah, right? Listenership decreasing by the week. Um, Be sure to check out our show notes. Or don't. Who fucking cares? You know, I put an awful lot of stuff in the uh, last show notes about the missing 411 stuff, like links to stories and more information. Also, you'll find links to other ways to listen to our podcast in case whatever you're doing right now is not sufficient for you. I'm not going to tell you how to live your life. That's on you. Not. Check out our website. I did recently redo the website. I'm not 100% sold on it. Oh, yeah. I'm supposed to look at that. Yeah. Problem is, I keep redoing various websites that I'm in control of, and I'm redoing them for desktop view, and then I go to phone view, and it's like pretty much the exact same as it ever was. Yeah, I should probably finish my website for my side gig that I don't have time to do right now. Yeah. I'm going to make some plum wine. That counts or something, plum wine. Right? That's right. I did put up a new shirt, in case anyone missed that. I was trying to ride the OnlyFans debacle and made an Only Phantoms shirt. If anyone's interested in that, I think it'll be good for Halloween. Who knows? I, I need to do some more shirts. Because mm-hmm. I'm starting to forget ideas that I had. You're going to have to like go back and listen to our episodes. I know. Fuck. Nobody wants to listen to those. <sighs> Actually, I've had quite a few listens this week for our back catalog. <laughs> more so than uh, our current episode. Interesting. Um, I did... I haven't been putting the episode up on YouTube for a while because the editor that I used for that broke in a way. I couldn't get the program to fix itself. Like, I uninstalled it and reinstalled it, and it still didn't fly. But I did figure out on my other editor how to make that same format of video fly. So I am slowly piecing those together, so those will all start showing up on YouTube again. One of these days, I'm buying a new computer that works, so that'll be exciting. You've been poked. And then you got smooch? Yep. A poking and a smooch. A poke and a smooch. I love you. Poking and a smooch. Poking and a smooch and a... Something, something. Dagger in the back. Anyway, enough of that rant. Uh, You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Facebook. Find us on, like I said, YouTube. You can find us. You can find us. You can probably find us under a bridge. (laughs) (laughs) We got some shirts. I I left stickers all up and down I-5 a couple weeks ago, so... I guess I didn't warn you to like just bring a pack of logo stickers with you because I was just leaving them at every rest stop that I stopped in. No, oh, I had some in my purse, but I always forget about them. Yeah. All right. That's that. Please drink responsibly and in accordance with your local laws. Don't end up our next ghost. Or our next hellhound. Or our next stone giant. You can be our next or- hellhound because I'm that white girl that will go up to you and rub your cheeks. <laughs> Rescue you. Ever. Take you. Who's a good hellhound? Who's a, Who's a we'll good take hound? you to Puppuccino. Sean's going to ask why we have a yard full of hellhounds. It's going to be a whole thing. All right. Thea wandered in. He's like, hellhounds? Puppuccino? Uh-huh. Puppuccino? Oh, well, now you're in trouble. He doesn't even know what that is. No. Uh, okay. Never been to star, but there he is. Hi, Theo. We got to say goodbye to everybody, because when we don't say goodbye to everyone, then I don't have any place to, like, edit the show at the end, and it just goes on forever and ever and ever. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Say bye, Theo. Bye. Bye-bye. Say goodnight, Theo. Goodnight, Theo. There we are. <laughs> bye. Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy?